You're watching the new stack makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. I'm very excited about this next conversation about really about open source and security. It's become such an interesting topic, especially with the need to really audit your S-bombs in many ways. And today I'm lucky to be joined by Omkar Rasaratnam, who is the new general manager for the Open Source Security Foundation. Hi, how are you? How are you? I'm lovely. Thank you so much for having us on. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and Brian Bellendorf. Hey, Brian, how are you? Uh, Brian is, is now the... Uh, CTO right. at the Open Source Security Foundation, very well-known technologist, and we were just having a conversation about lettuce and warehouses and <laughs> and rhubarb and should rhubarb not be in a pie. And yeah. how do you know if you're, you know, like who who to go to if like your romaine lettuce is like making you not feel so well? And there's some like corollaries there to software and open source components and security, and so. I want to just preface this by saying I had this nice conversation yesterday with someone we both know, Sam Ramsey. Mm -hmm. And I and I was saying to him, like, Sam, how do I get ready for this interview? What should I be talking about? And and he talked about Log4J, right? And he said, mm -hmm. listen, you know, one of the really big problems is how do you get upstream, how do you, the vulnerability gets discovered, it's a bad one, or even not so bad. How do you get it from upstream to downstream as quickly and efficiently as possible? And what we see now is Log4J is this issue with like people still using, uh, you know, still using um, very old versions. And so maybe we could talk about that in the context of your own mission and what you're trying to do at the at the Security Foundation. And there's some other topics I'd like to explore too. Sure. That okay. sounds great. Um, so thank you for asking about that. And uh, Sam's a lovely person. We really enjoyed working with him. My perspective, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swing wide, but then zoom back sure. into what your question was. I think if you, look at the, if you look at the vulnerability that was there within Log4j, it was a format string vulnerability. I would love to be efficient about how we address systemic issues like that. It's a very classical case of a security issue. It's not something novel. I'd like to ensure that we start by making our software secure by construction so the issues like that don't exist at all. Through education, through using different techniques, hardened libraries, well-vetted patterns for addressing those kind of issues. Now, when issues like that do occur, then you're right. We do have to jump into rapid response mode. We have to have not only, as you pointed out, a good mechanism of traversing stuff from upstream all the way back down to what's running in prod, but that's where artifacts like SBOM come in. And SBOM, I will be the first to say, feel free to quote, S-bombs are not a panacea. They, they don't fix everything, but they give you telemetry. They let you know where to, where to look to next. I've run production infrastructure, and when you run production infrastructure, the best thing you can get is telemetry that tells you what you need to protect when events like this break out. So in my opinion, that's how I would like to weight our focus on addressing issues like that. Mm -hmm. Brian, what do you think? Well, at, at the OpenSSF, we're trying to think holistically about the software supply chain, right? right? And how to look for defects, in, uh, how to track the distribution of software through things like SBOMs, and how to drive a culture where dependencies get updated much more, much more rapidly than they were before. You're absolutely right. There are a lot of organizations who, when Log4J hit, said, oh, don't worry, we're not vulnerable because we're running an older version of Log4J, forgetting that there had been no uh, updates to even that old 1.x stream in five years, not even security fixes, right? Um, we talked to some of uh, fr our friends in government a few days ago who told us one of the main drivers for this desire to have S-bombs in government adoption is they don't know when they were, they didn't know when they were done, when they were remediating the log4j breach, right? The, the S-bomb on a piece of software is like the ingredients on the back of a ketchup bottle, and they can tell you when, you know, uh, oh, there happens to be paprika in there as a food coloring, right? right. Well, if you're allergic to paprika, then you want, want to know this yeah. stuff, right? And, and for the same reason, labeling just the raw ingredients
resilience of like all the software packages that we're pulling down and running to know when we're done, like, to be able to go and address these issues is, is one step. But there's other uses for SBOMs that once we have this metadata channel, we're going to be able to do. And at the OpenSSF, tying that together with our work on SigStore, which are signatures on objects, with our work on Salsa, which is about traceable provenance, all of these pieces are going to come together uh, and have been coming together, and we can talk more about this. Let's talk about SBOMs first, though. Yeah. So one, so, you know, so how you create an SBOM really can help, can to be, can really define how SBOMs can be aggregated for that metadata, correct? Yes. Yeah. And so you can do some computations on the data itself, correct? Yeah, the idea is at the tail end of this, you should be able to feed all that SBOM data into like a dashboard that shows you, you know, not only all the information about how, what are the components, but ultimately how were they built, um, and might allow you to also map that to, you know, if you've got other data about, hey, log4j is potentially kind of risky, right? You know, maybe, we, even though we are three or four layers down <laughs> the distribution channel, maybe we want to highlight to our vendor, you know, you should be using a more current version of this, or an alternative to it that's less risky. Is there an opportunity to start build, you know, start to kind of like take the, the, that computational capability and finding ways that we can kind of look at the, the aggregate of the data itself to be able to then start providing almost automated processes for moving things, so moving things out of this danger zone into a more sustainable kind of approach? Yeah, I think Brian highlighted this well. From my point of view, Again, our goal is to ensure that we're making software more safe for the, better, for the greater public good. SBOMs are a core part of that. They, performed, they provide telemetry, they provide data that we can reason over when making some of these decisions, be they build time or runtime. You as a developer, to one of the points that Brian was making earlier, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could also provide some kind of reputation data on a particular repo that you've decided to link against. Wouldn't it be great if you had that full inventory of the time that you used that GCC compiler flag that could have caused some kind of regression? All of this data is extremely valuable, and I think for a long time we, in enterprise in general, in production environments, have been fumbling around with imprecise data and have been unable to really leverage all the telemetry we could be using in properly sequencing not only incident response, but thinking through what production infrastructure looks like. For the last 20 years, 30 years maybe, it used to be called the SANS Top 20, I think it's now called the CIS Top 20, which ascribe things that should be important to security departments. Number one on that list for the last 30 years has been asset management, know your stuff. This right. gets back to that. <clears throat> so, the next question I have is about package management. Yeah. And we've seen the increase in package, package, packages for enterprise applications, for example, increase quite a bit. What's been the effects of that, and what is the open SSF's role in that? Thinking it from that developer perspective, like what is it that is important for them to know? Well, I, you know, when I started working on open source code back when dinosaurs roamed the web, um, I, I remember you'd, that <clears throat> you'd get your source tarball from, you know, an Apache org distribution yeah. site, pull it down, compile it locally. Um, I also loved the FreeBSD port system, which kind of automated that process, but it was still all about compiling things locally. No one does that anymore because right. no one has the time. Former Gen two developer, I think right. you're wrong. Right. Well, okay, <laughs> I'm teasing, right, because Gen two was all about compiling exactly, locally too. Exactly. Um, but I, I, and still is, and and that's like the paranoid setting, right? I'll compile everything from scratch. But today, most people pull things down from package managers. Uh, and, and, and you know, there's this spectrum from, you know, wide open, everything could go in there, uh, anyone can upload anything to it, <clears throat> to things like the Apple App Store, <laughs> uh, or the kind of, you know, the commercial ones, where there's a tremendous amount invested in security and fighting fraud and typo squatting and those kinds of things. And the existing repositories, you know, NPM, PyPy, Maven Central, <clears throat> we're working with them through a working group uh, focused on the needs of the uh, uh, of, of the securing software repositories uh, to start to ask what are some of the low hanging fruit that collectively repositories can start <clears throat> to do or standards they can start to establish things like multi factor auth to try you know multi factor auth at least for your top couple hundred projects right the one in top being measured by how critical they are in the rest of the open source ecosystem data we've also developed through a different part of the open SSF uh, called assessing software uh, criticality uh, or 
working group focused on that. So by trying to identify that, trying to say, are there other processes, uh, and, and a big one I'll note is GitHub recently announced that they've uh, introduced support in the NPM package manager for right. provenance traceability, right. bringing together, again, Salsa and Sigstore um, to try to say, now these packages, here's the traceable, verifiable, signatures you know, linked uh, uh, path to the original source code by the original developers. And that's that's how you get to that the question you asked at the beginning, how do I know, let, you know uh, where the source is, how I can dive into it, how I can look for problems, that's how you know, uh, rather than just trusting that some entry could, in a repo Could that be like a, I mean in very simple terms, could that be a database? Could it, be a, it looks like a database, uh, both one that you have locally that you can compute and uh, check verif and signatures against and have high confidence actually is, is the truth, uh, as well as obviously repositories and, 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 and sites like, I don't know if you've seen depths.dev uh, uh, or um, some of the other kind of uh, third party resources out there for developers to, to just understand the shape of the open source ecosystem, understand the shape of this software and the, de the dependencies underneath it and are there outstanding uh, software vulnerabilities in them, that's sort of thing. I guess that's my question, when a million flowers bloom, like an open source project can come from anywhere, right? That's right. You know, <clears throat> I mean, there's lots of kind of um, issues that uh, are part of everyday life. I mean, we read every day about geopolitical issues, for instance, right? So, when you're thinking about this, like, like if I'm like, if I'm like you know, building a, a service and it has multiple components to it, you know, two thirds of them are open source components and and I'm pulling these from anywhere, right? What are the methods now for verifying the veracity of, of, those, of those components versus what we want to get to? What is that delta there? So I think Brian highlighted a number of technologies that are <clears throat> incubated, endorsed, uh, suggested by the OpenSSF that are excellent for this. But it's important to remember what these represent in terms of your build process. We have assured cryptographically that the thing that you pulled via SigStore hasn't been altered. That doesn't mean that the code itself is good. It doesn't mean it hasn't been scanned for vulnerabilities. These are things you will also need to assure. So much like the SBOM doesn't fix all the things. On its own, SigStore will not fix all the things. But what we want to do is assemble these well understood technologies in a manner that will allow you to reason over whether you should have confidence in the source where these things came from. To Brian's point, uh, well, a, a tarball is a package <laughs> of sorts, yeah. but there could have been so much variability in when you built that, when you hit configure, make, make, install, as to how that software would react in production because you hadn't constrained the possible differences in your build path. And that's what we're trying to do. Good security is about predictable, reproducible builds. And I believe that's going to that's really going to take us into the future. What do you think, Brian? I, I think I want to add to this, you know, across the open source landscape, there's a high degree of variability in quality. I mean, we all know this, like right. some is higher quality than others, but also in the adoption of practices that tend to lead to fewer bugs. Right. And we have a, a project at the OpenSSF called the Security Scorecard, yeah. which runs automatically across, uh, actually we've run it across a million different repositories uh, uh, right. at, at GitHub, and developed a, a score between zero and nine for, uh, I, you know, the, the Think of it like a credit score, right? Like, yeah. based on all of these heuristics about that project, do they do fuzz testing? Uh, do they do, you know, is it in a language that supports memory safety? Like, all these things that aren't necessarily proof that there's a bug, but hint at it. We can say this package has a risk of seven or a risk of three, right? And that should be a factor in developers deciding which dependency to pull in when they have a choice between one, two, or three. It also should be a factor when a risk manager is looking at the software, open source software they've deployed. And they should be able to then go back and go, this thing is kind of hovering around two. Can we take that to, you know, or find an alternative that is a higher score to reduce our overall systemic risk? This is how we go and prevent the next log for shell vulnerability being a major disaster. Log4j, and I'll just end with this. The Log4j developers, they're professionals. They were working diligently against yeah. a set of features that they wanted. They were fixing bugs. Yeah. You know, they were triaging reports. But there's this section of code the, what didn't quite have the attention, everything else did, that it turned out there had been this bug for quite a while. Yeah. 
And it might have been <clears throat> caught, and this is what blows people's mind, for all of the tens of billions of dollars in lost productivity or other costs yeah. attributable to log for shell this could have been caught and fixed for the, for the cost of a third-party audit, which would have run, and including remediation, about 100 grand. So, right. we, you know, 100 grand, I mean, the ROI on that, so to speak, would have been fabulous had we known that's the one to fix. Hard to measure, but, like, that would have been the one to fix. But how do we go and find the next log for shell uh, problem, right? The next packages that, even if well-maintained, might have this phone. And that's, that's really an area of interest for us. But this is the toughest battle, I think, that you're going to face. I mean, or we're all going to face. Like, you know, um, it's a culture issue, right? I mean... So, uh, you know, developer has is responsible for delivering feature updates to the product every week. Or, you know, for example, you know, uh, the, the developer says, you know, this week we're just going to be working on the code. Mm -hmm. We're just going to maintain the code, and uh, we're not going to have any feature updates this week. And the product manager's like, "What are you talking about?" Well, we just think it's better for the long-term health of the project. Refactoring. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Paying off and, the, and the product manager says, you know, I love this idea. I think it's great. Let's get the features out, and then we can talk. Right? So this is a cultural problem. How, I mean, like, if you, you cannot be effective with all the tools in the world. You cannot be effective unless you have a cultural shift. And that shift, it seems to be like more of like, like you're saying, like 100K, Makes sense, right? Now it does. In retrospect. Right, right. Back then, moving along. Yeah. So how does the OpenSF play in that? So um, hindsight is always twenty twenty. Uh, and Brian, maybe you can cover some of the stuff about Alpha Omega in a sec. The perspective I'd like to provide you is that of somebody that's worked both in enterprise as well as software product teams before. And the manner that I, as an engineering director, would it use to provide incentive to my teams, and I'd encourage other engineering managers to do the same, this is a unified backlog. This isn't a, like, you don't get to ship unless you complete all of your P0s. Right. A security itself is a code quality issue, much like you would not ship if your code didn't pass through the linter cleanly. Right. You need to address your security issues. It is not optional. And Brian, I really like the way that you spoke about some of these ideas, almost like a credit score. Like you can't swipe your card again if you're overbalanced. You can't extend further credit. And the more that we provide metrics around that so we can reason over whether these are good business decisions or whether we are perhaps causing ourselves the next log4j issue, I think I have faith that much like we want to improve software for the better good of society, that everybody else would rather avoid these I can't imagine how many people lost holidays over <laughs> over the log for shell issue. But Brian, maybe you can talk about <clears throat> the uh, Alpha and Mega work. Yeah, um, and and before jumping into that, uh, you know, we talked a little bit before uh, the the cameras rolled about uh, metaphors for software, right. right? And and I said, you know, thinking of software like a like a bar of gold sitting in a safe yeah. is the wrong metaphor right. because it perishes. It's more right. like heads of lettuce, yes. right? right? That very quickly shift from being an asset yeah. in your your ledger to a liability, yes. right? You know, worse than zero, less right. than zero value, they become a risk for you. And what we don't have in FASB accounting standards, what we don't have in the insurance industry, uh, is a great objective way of being able to measure what's the what's the risk and what's the, the negative asset value right. <laughs> of a software code base that has accumulated so much technical debt, that has accumulated so much right. risk, that really the organization now it elevates to a board conversation. The Log4j thing elevated to a board conversation for many large organizations organizations that are not technology organizations when their auditors told them, when their risk and compliance people told them that, you know, this is now a big issue because they could be liable for millions of dollars in breaches, right? So this is this is one thing that I think will result from the work that's going on in the open source community about measurability of risk around software. Certainly, if you're including insecure dependencies, you should clean that up. Not all dependencies, insecure dependencies are a real problem, but if we can develop standards for figuring out how to assess that in an objective way that could drive 
you know, cybersecurity risk premium, you know, uh, risk insurance premiums, you know, that could incentivize that kind of could, behavior. There's, there, there's a whole, you, so that there's if, a whole economic model. So there. that engineer yeah. says, I'm going to take a week to do this yeah. non-feature work, but we're going to bring down our insurance premiums by yeah. doing this. So we're going to like make look better in that dashboard for the board, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, by doing this work. Then, then it's an easy yes for them to, to tackle. We're coming at the end of our time here. I want to just thank you both yeah. for. Uh, having this conversation. I, I could talk with you another hour, but we'll maybe we'll find another time to do that. But thank you very much to both of you and congratulations on your new role. Thank you. Appreciate and Brian, you having you as us. Well. Thank you very thank much. You. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.